Please welcome Naveen Rao, Chief AI Officer of Databricks. Um, Naveen Rao, I'm the uh, head of AI at Databricks, and uh, you know, pleasure to be here at uh, Mobile World Congress 2025. It's, uh, it's not a typical uh, conference for us to attend at Databricks because we are a data technology. We primarily work in the cloud and, and, uh, and do modernization of your data stack and, uh, and, and, and providing all the technologies therein. So I want to talk a little bit about what we see from our customers and maybe some of the barriers to adoption for generative AI. I mean, We've talked a lot about you know, the, uh, the future that's going to come, but let's talk about some of the problems that we have today and some of the things that we're addressing as a company. So intention is all you need. The reason I say that is it's a, it's a play on a paper that was actually core to the generative AI revolution. And you know, actually, it's very important to why people use generative AI uh, in general, and I will get there in a moment. Uh, I was previously the CEO of a company called Mosaic ML, which was acquired by Databricks in 2023. And we used memes to communicate quite a lot inside the company. In fact, memes, I think, are very interesting. It's a way to uh, uh, communicate in very compact ways. So, you know, we've been hearing why generative AI is awesome. It's everywhere, right? <laughs> Maybe it's not yet. Why is it not yet? And uh, let's talk about this and kind of think, about, think through the economics of, uh, uh, of delivering these solutions and why and when it will actually start to uh, proliferate into many different applications. So let's take a step back to a point in time of the Industrial Revolution. There was a, an observation called Jivon's Paradox, where increased efficiency of a technology, call it disruption in current parlance, uh, led to higher consumption of a technology. What I mean by this is this was actually observed when he decreased the price of delivering electricity, like decreased it by a factor of two, you actually increase the consumption by more than 2x. You actually spend more money on something even though it became cheaper to deliver it. It turns out when you improve technology, you actually increase its applicability. Because it's half the price, you now apply that technology to something new that you didn't before. It was too expensive, that was the barrier, and then now you actually can apply it to that. So this is actually kind of a fundamental concept here in the generative AI space. So at Mosaic, we actually observed, and this is in 2021, it was before the ChatGPT moment, but in the academic world, we, we knew large language models were coming. We knew scale was very important. And cost of training was actually uh, a big problem and serving. And we observed that a model of a particular capability will be approximately one-fourth the price to train and serve in one year. So we called this Mosaic's Law. And it's actually kind of held up uh, through all of the different transitions. 400% per year is quite amazing. I mean, if we look at something like Moore's Law, which is another big exponential on which the technology world was built, um, that's something like 40% per year. It's 2x every two years. This is 10 times that. So you can imagine this causes all kinds of weird disruptions and distortions in the economics of delivering these solutions. You know, we talked a little bit about DeepSeek earlier. Um, you know, that, that kind of took the world by storm just recently because the cost was shown to be so much cheaper. But we're seeing this across every model, um, model provider out there, is that the cost of delivering the models drops precipitously. The applicability of a model and its performance is you know, on the order of months, not years. So why haven't these cheap models caused this massive disruption where we see generative AI everywhere? The simple answer is that we, the, the decrease in cost is actually not all that's required. So I'm going to modify this Givon's paradox in the current, current viewpoint of the world and actually say it's decreased friction that actually leads to this, this disruption. And we, think, we can think about generative AI as removing friction from taking intention to action. This is what we've been talking about with agents and things like this. So what are some of those points of friction today that, that maybe we haven't been considering? It's not just about cost. One of the big ones is actually user interface. So today we think about generative AI and a chatbot. ChatGPT kind of took the, to, you know, uh, made, drew, drove an awareness to everyone about these technologies. But the user interface actually is, is quite important to delivering um, these capabilities in a, in a form that's, that's actually consumable by, by many users. Having broad applicability requires a UI. So what is a UI? 
The UI is really a way to describe intent. So if you go back to like when uh, cars started to come on the scene in the late, in the early 1900s, um, the, the dominant uh, transportation was a horse and carriage. How did you drive a horse and carriage? The UI was, were two reins. You actually describe your intention to the horse and tell it which way, where you want to go, how fast you want it to go, if you want it to break, that sort of thing. Turns out we had to rethink that UI. If you ask people then what they wanted, they actually wanted reins to control a motor vehicle. That wasn't sufficient for something that had more power and was faster and things like this, so we had to invent the steering wheel. That seems like a simple innovation, but actually it's quite hard. It took a lot of iterations to come to the simple uh, interface of a steering wheel and two pedals or three pedals. So I think these kind of innovations allow us to consume that technology. Now we can, we can have motor cars in, you know, in the hands of many people. So UIs are actually kind of complicated. It's not just one UI is going to solve everything. It's actually, there's a, there's a trade-off between vagueness of the UI and, um, and kind of accessibility. When something is very precise, it's actually quite hard. So even in English, if I were to, or, or any human language, there's very precise language, like legal language and, and jargon, or there's very imprecise language, the way we talk to each other. Turns out we actually communicate in precise ways, but we use tons of context. So getting that UI right for the application you care about is really the name of the game right now. So one of the big innovations that happened in the mobile world was the swipe on a phone, like swipe, pinch, and zoom. These kinds of things are, are huge UI innovations, which basically made consuming that technology so much easier and, and frictionless. So the way I like to think about a UI is expressing intent and, and letting the computer or the machine carry out the execution. So in a Rube Goldberg machine, which many of you I'm sure have heard of, it's it's complicated set of steps to go and do something simple at the end, but really it all gets kicked off by something simple, like in this case, setting a particular time on the clock. That's my intent, that's saying I want the machine to go, and the rest of it's all execution. And this is not a new concept. Computers have taken many, many years to iterate and come up with a UI that allowed us to consume that new technology. So if, you, if anyone is around that remembers, uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was actually very esoteric to deal with a computer. You had to write code or, or some sort of very specific, uh, precise language. Over time, we built these UIs, and the internet came about, and mobile computing, and really, that allowed us to consume these capabilities. It's really the same kind of machine we've been building for 50 years. It's just gotten a lot easier to use. And now, everybody can use it. You don't need to be an expert. It became something very simple. So with this UI innovation, it drastically increased accessibility. So let's come back to the current moment in generative AI. We need more than chatbots. Chatbots are a general way to express intent. In human language, I can express actually any intent. However, it's very cumbersome. I can actually write code to express intent in precise ways or write legal language. All of that accomplishes the goal of a UI, but it's very slow. I don't want to have to tell a computer, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to point and click and, and do you know, kind of other sorts of actions. I want it to understand the context in which I'm coming from. You know, if I'm asking for, um, uh, you know, where's the local restaurant and it's 6 p.m., maybe I want dinner. You know, these kind of uh, contextualized responses actually start becoming very, very important. And really, we need the proper UIs on top of these capabilities to make that happen. So Gen AI converts intent into action. Some UIs are super in, in, intuitive. Like, if I'm a dog and I lay out a, a bunch of biscuits here, can anyone figure out what that dog wants? I think its intention is pretty clear. So if we can build machines to basically take that intent and translate it into the desired action, that's really the goal of generative AI. That's the disruption that's going to come, uh, come ahead of us, is just making this execution part of the world much, much more frictionless, decreased cost, and just accessible to many more people. So really, the innovation of generative AI plus UI is the democratization of capabilities. So let me talk a little bit about what we do at Databricks. So uh, Databricks is a, is, a, is a data platform that traditionally is sold to data engineers. These are the people who are tasked with um, organizing data in a company, building a data foundation in a company. And SQL is one of the main tools, SQL, is one of the main tools that uh, uh, data engineers use in a, in a data warehouse. And so this is a, a block of SQL code here. So you may not think of code as being a, a, you know, a, a particularly useful or, or accessible UI, but it actually turns out APIs are exactly that. Designing a very good API 
for usage in code is actually quite hard. It takes a lot of iteration. And this is something that we've seen a lot of uptake on recently is a simple thing where it's this AI query. AI query is a way to do what we call batch inference. I can take a whole bunch of columns and, and rows in a table, so I have a bunch of data in that table, and just say, summarize it. Putting that into a SQL function, that's super easy to use. I can specify the model, I can specify the data, and doing it in line actually unlocks a huge amount of usage. It's just a kind of interesting phenomenon. We had many different iterations of this. When we got it right, all of a sudden people can use it, and they get tons of value out of it. Another such innovation is actually um, data engineers and Databricks code within a, uh, within a notebook. You can write Python or SQL code within these notebooks. And uh, if anyone's written code, you know, oftentimes you'll have some sort of error. Maybe you have a syntax error where you, you know, didn't have a, uh, you had an extra space or you spelled something wrong. And finding those errors can actually be you know, a fair bit of work. In fact, it probably takes as much time to debug something as it does to write it, or even more. So what we built now is an interface where you click run, there's, just, there's a runtime error, and actually there's, a, there's an AI that says, I'm diagnosing the error for you, and I'm providing a fix, and I'm doing it right there in the UI itself. So again, that allows you to consume that capability. You don't have to take the code and paste it into a chat bot or something like that. It's right there where you need it, when you need it. So it's about getting the right information to the right user at the right time. So this idea of, uh, of bringing customized capabilities built upon your data is something we call at Databricks data intelligence. This is the idea that my data becomes um, a moat. It becomes something that is a unique differentiator and advantage to me as a company. And inside of Databricks, we allow you to take that data and actually customize the use of AI. Customizing and contextualizing AI is really what we're all about. The data platform, the, the, the modern data architecture where there's a single source of truth for everything is kind of the new way of building a company. The old way was really using lots of vertical SaaS apps that all had their own uh, you know, sort of data storage and data foundation. Now we're unifying that into one data platform, and what that allows you to do is contextualize responses across many different applications from all kinds of different data. You don't need to have your marketing and HR and supply chain data in different places. You want them in one place, in one format, so you can use that cont to contextualize all of your generative AI. So what's, what else is an impediment to, to scaling up? Well, I look at this almost like a, a concept from psychology we call Maslow's hierarchy. So really, this, this states if I want to get to self-actualization or you know, some sort of a, a, a contentment state, as a human being, I actually need to have other parts of my life figured out, like my basic physiological needs. I need to have food, I need to have shelter, um, other, other things that allow us to build up to that. There's a very similar concept in, uh, in AI where I have to have a set of um, uh, basic essentials before I can actually build those world-changing outcomes. And, uh, and I think this is something that's not really talked about. We talk about the outcome, but we actually need to build all of this stuff here. And so part of that is security and governance. Inside of Databricks, we've built uh, the most unified platform for doing full end-to-end -end governance, lineage tracking, monitoring, um, you know, security on top of your data. Again, this is essential for building, uh, building customized AI, data intelligence, that contextualizes the responses. So reality as an industry, what we've observed across our 12,000 customers in the enterprise is that we're really at this point. We're just now understanding how to move from that security, secured governed layer of data onto the UI and actually deliver these insights with generative AI. So, you know, within the uh, uh, mobile and, you know, kind of edge sphere, we talk a lot about, like, using technology because it's there. If I have a fatter pipe of data, I want to use that. If I have more compute on device, I want to use that. But really, the UI should be dictating these, these requirements. So if something is a very latency-sensitive or privacy-sensitive application, I want, to I want to move that to device. If something requires higher quality or access to new data, I want to have that in the cloud. And really, a real application is a mix of these things. All of this is possible when you have this unified modern data architecture. Now you can start to think about, OK, this is where that data lives, this is where this lives, and you can start to, to, to contextualize the responses on the device for the application in the right way, because you've put everything into a, into a unified format. So really, the UI and cost will unlock the consumption of AI capabilities. 
We're seeing things climb pretty fast. It's not as fast as a lot of people anticipated in terms of uptake of UI, and really, this is the thing. It's really Jivon's paradox at play. So if you're interested on how we approach the problem of modern data architectures and, and contextualizing your generative AI, please come and talk with us. Scan this code. We're here, and we're, uh, we're very excited to, to work in the telco space. Thank you for your time and attention.